This is a production of Cornell University. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the 2023 HEMP webinar series. Uh, my name is Luis Monserrate. I'm a second year PhD student in plant breeding and genetics in Larry Smart's lab at Cornell University. And once again, I'm accompanied by Tony uh, Barraco, Cornell alum, who has assisted uh, with this webinar series, as well as Gemma and Kim, who have um, provided this digital platform for us, a webinar series. Um, lastly, I just want to mention that this webinar series is a component of a larger project, which is the development of eight educational modules that will be freely available on the Cornell HAMP website at the end of the webinar series. Each module will have the recorded webinar, the instructional slide deck, and a set of high impact papers pertaining to the respective subject. For instance, for this subject or for this module, that will be on hemp, hemp harvest. All webinars and recordings of them will be available on the Cornell SIPS YouTube channel. Um, so if you're interested in rewatching them or sharing them with somebody else that couldn't attend on a specific date. Uh, so with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Stephen Philpott. He is a Marine Corps veteran and a current um, environmental biological science graduate researcher at Chicago State University. And his talk today is going to be on cannabis glandular trichome relevance to harvest. So with that, Steve, please take it away. Um, hi, Louise. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the introduction. I appreciate that. Um, thank you to Cornell for hosting this platform and uh, for being featured among the other featured speakers. Um, awesome. So today uh, I'm going to be talking about cannabis glandular trichomes. I know a lot of us have heard of them um, and are familiar with them kind of as a, a more broad topic, but I just want to kind of talk more about um, these, these glandular trichomes, why they're relevant to harvest, kind of the information that we know now, some of the information that's coming out, and then um, kind of want to talk about some of my work and why it may, uh, you know, be relevant to uh, any producers that are cultivating uh, floral cannabis, and we'll kind of talk about some of those differences. Um, to dive straight in, um, so everybody's kind of familiar with a lot of the policy, but I just want to make it clear. Um, all of the, when I say cannabis used in my research, it all was federally compliant hemp. Um, these were all um, state approved hemp cultivars. Um, so one of the reasons that we kind of um, obviously had to use hemp is because of the DEA schedule and status, and we do not have a license. So um, just want to make that clear, but I do kind of want to talk about some of the discrepancies um, because this is relevant to uh, farmers that are looking to um, kind of learn more about harvesting. Um, the DEA Schedule One status kind of changes a lot of our ability uh, to do research on obviously hemp and uh, drug type or, or above 0.3% THC cannabis marijuana. Um, and the, the research gridlock, as I call it, is kind of a contradiction that has kind of slowed down research for a while. Um, the DEA has it scheduled saying that there's no current medical uses, um, but the FDA has already approved of, you know, uh, multi multiple drugs. Um, and when we go to policy, we hear a lot of times that more research is needed. So um, I hope that although this is about floral hemp, it can kind of be understood as more of a, um, an overall topic uh, in floral cannabis as well. Um, one of the reasons being is because this is, uh, I took this from the USDA uh, Plants Database Classification Report of 2021, um, and this was kind of how the classifications of uh, hemp and marijuana are specified or classified um, on a more ta taxonomical um, basis. So you can see the genus, it says, um, you know, uh, cannabis sativa L, it has this marijuana, but it also has hemp above that. Um, and then as you move further down to these subspecies, you see there's cannabis sativa L subspecies sativa, cannabis sativa L subspecies indica. And I realized that this naming uh, issue becomes difficult for farmers um, who are looking to uh, find this kind of data that's specific to something that is more applicable to their end use. All that to say, um, you know, two of the biggest issues when we hear things like sativa and indica um, there are some vast assumptions that go along with this, and this is kind of what's relevant to harvest. Um, I have experience working in a retail setting, and that's kind of what got me interested to really jump into the research. Um, we would get cultivars with the same name, but the actual metabolite profile, which is what floral cannabis is typically sold for, um, it varied vastly every different time, batch to batch. And for, you know, people who are medical 
uh, consumers, you know, sometimes they would have different effects. So this was very important that we needed to look more into the consistency of the production of these metabolite profiles. Um, sometimes there would be little to no terpenes. Sometimes the cannabinoids themselves would be, um, you know, uh, vastly different. Um, the reason I bring all that up is because a lot of the assumptions when you go to a retail setting, um, they're classified as a sativa or an indica. Um, and I think most of us know at this point that um, those terms don't uh, necessarily correlate to the metabolites that are responsible for the effects that these titles have claimed. Um, so the reason that I say all this is because the inheritance principles, like the basic principles for genetics, that wasn't something that was published until 1865. And Carl Linnaeus and John Baptiste Lamarck actually made these designations of indica and sativa way prior to that. Um, so all that to say, these terms are, are, are being used incorrectly in retail settings when it comes to being able to describe the metabolites um, that the product is being sold for. Uh, so what are the big problems? Uh, some of the biggest problems I'd say are a lack of federal best management practices. If you look up most common crops in your region, you can find some type of uh, best management practices based on your soil uh, makeup, based on your pH, based on kind of your little microclimate where you live. Um, and with cannabis, it's very difficult uh, because you don't find this information publicly, although there are more research uh, projects obviously coming up with agronomic data for local farmers. And that's why we're doing things like this. Um, I say that to say that for cultivation, harvest, post-harvest, and storage, um, there is not a lot of research uh, diving into trichomes um, and necessarily how the trichome density or quantity affect the metabolites. Um, to take kind of like a 300-foot view, to take a step back, we base the legality off of cannabis plants, right? Hemp is below 0.3% THC. Uh, marijuana is considered above 0.3% THC. These arbitrary definitions uh, aren't necessarily benefiting uh, cannabis cultivators who are cultivating for floral uh, hemp who want to remain compliant. Um, so long story short, this is really what got me interested. The industry standard of trichome analysis, as most people are familiar with, you either have a, a light microscope, a jeweler's loop, a magnifying glass, um, there's typically just a visual analysis of, you know, these trichomes look clear, cloudy, or amber. Those are typically the three, um, excuse me, those are typically the three kind of physical features that people are looking for when they're looking at what people might say ripeness. Um, although that may help, that is a very subjective means of analyzing what the actual cannabinoid concentration is. At what point are you at risk for being non-compliant? At what point are you, uh, should you harvest based on what you want? You know, uh, people say 70% cloud or 30% amber. These are all very subjective uh, means of analysis and kind of passing those on um, just makes it even more subjective. So long story short, I got very, very interested in trichomes um, and another means of analyzing them kind of on a deeper scale. Um, the lack of insight into factors affecting secondary metabolite production meaning pre and post harvest. Again, we're looking at these trichomes kind of with the naked eye or with the magnifying glass, but that is a lot different than actually homogenizing that sample, mixing it with the solvent, running it through some type of chromatography machine and getting the cannabinoid concentrations. Um, another issue with that is how cost effective is that for farmers to do that regularly? Can they test at week one, two, three, four? Can they test regularly? And how consistent are these tests? Um, so that's, again, another risk of compliance. Um, and then long story short, this entire industry is driven, driven now by retail, uh, mostly, um, even though there are still medical consumers. And the demand for quality products um, is kind of an issue right now, because if you look at a lot of farmers, they're struggling financially because there's a surplus in products. Um, but the quality kind of across the board, across the nation, as we rapidly legalize, isn't keeping up. Um, with this kind of rapid mass production of cannabis. So um, that's all we're talking about, trichomes and how they relate to harvest. Very simple. Uh, most people know the basic life cycles of cannabis. Um, you have your seed, right? Seedling, excuse me, or your clone if you decide to start with uh, propagation. Um, during this phase, the plant is spending most of its energy and resources, right? Establishing its roots. Um, during its vegetative stage, once you start seeing rapid and, and, and uh, consistent growth and development of roots and shoots, 
Um, you kind of have this vegeta vegetative growth going on, but flowering is kind of what I want to talk about today because when we're talking about cannabis that's harvested for cannabinoid rich or, or terpene rich uh, uh, biomass, we're talking about harvesting flowers. Um, that's also really important because a lot of policy um, kind of groups in uh, fiber cannabis, grain cannabis, seed cannabis, um, and even non-flowering cannabis into the same group. Um, and from what we know right in the literature is that this flowering stage is when these metabolites start producing and when we start seeing these trichomes that we're talking about. Um, so this is one of my favorite Im images and I wanna kind of take a second to break it down. Um, when we say we're looking at trichomes, we're talking about these epidermal growths. We're talking about what people would say uh, makes cannabis look frosty or shimmery or, or, or shiny. Um, there's these resin filled glands that grow during flowering that provide uh, protection to the outer layer of the plant. What's really, really interesting about these is that um, they rapidly, rapidly increase in their growth and development during flowering. Um, but we don't necessarily know how they exactly contribute to the cannabinoid concentrations that we're seeing in the test. It's a lot different to test, uh, you know, maybe something called KEF, which is isolated trichomes versus testing an entire, uh, like picture A here, what we call an entire complete inflorescence where there's stalks, there's leaves, there's flowers, and maybe not all of these pieces have the same coverage of trichomes. Uh, meaning that they potentially have different metabolites, um, even in, in, in locations that are close to each other. Uh, image B is one individual calyx underneath the light microscope. Um, it's actually the bract that's covering the calyx. If you look at the very top, you can see these orange um, style that are protruding out that would catch pollen on a live plant um, if it was to be pollinated. Like most of us know, um, Floor cannabis, we typically don't, right? We don't want it pollinated so those seeds produce. We want those trichomes to continue producing secondary metabolites until whatever point the cultivator or farmer decides, hey, this is when I want to go ahead and harvest. Um, image C is what I've actually am, analyzed in my research. So uh, most of the time when we do testing, it's a, we, we say we homogenize the sample, right? So we kind of take that sample A, uh, with the leaves, with the stalks, and also with the calyx, and we would kind of crush it all together, and we would analyze that sample. What's really interesting is something that, you know, is, is already in other research is that the trichomes, the glandular trichomes don't develop uh, at the same density or quantity at every location, and if you look at image C, it's pretty easy to tell that. Um, if you look at the red arrow, that's going to be a bract, so that's what's actually that protective specialized leaf that's covering that calyx. And then if you look in this really, really trichome dense area, um, and when, when we're talking about trichomes, you'll be able to notice them obviously because of these circular heads, they almost don't fit in. Um, they look very intentionally built. But this, this, this section that where the, um, excuse me, where the green arrow is pointing is covered in glandular trichomes and that's gonna be our calyx. Um, and then if you look over to the right, the blue is actually the base of again that what you see is that orange stigma sticking out in that, in that uh, image B. And the image D is going to be uh, zoomed in. This is really where I do a lot of my work so that I can look at the morphological differences between different trichomes. Um, I'll start with this yellow arrow at the top on image D all the way to the right. That's going to be a non-glandular trichome. So these trichomes don't uh, produce secondary metabolites. These trichomes are more of a physical barrier. Honestly, I like to think of them as a if you ever see, they put the spikes on top of a doorway sometimes so, so birds don't just hang out there. Um, I like to think of those uh, non-glandular trichomes as these physical barriers. Uh, whereas this red arrow, this blue arrow, and this green arrow, these are all glandular trichomes. And we're going to talk about the different types of glandular trichomes, some of the differences and, and things of that nature. Um, but these trichomes are where the secondary metabolites are produced. And I really want to take a second so everybody, we all know this, but sometimes we rush past it. Um, a lot of this floral or biomass material when we're, when we're running tests, when we're actually analyzing for cannabinoid concentrations, we're not necessarily looking for that. Most of us, if you, if you think about it, we're looking to quantify um, the metabolites that are produced and stored in the, the glandular heads um, of these um, glandular trichomes. The red arrow is going to be a stalk glandular trichome. The word before the glandular is usually what tells you where the position is or the morphology. So stalk glandular tri trichome is self-explanatory. 
Um, there's a large stalk that actually uh, raises the glandular head above the surface. Um, you'll see sessile glandular trichomes, which can be similar or, or close to the same size as stalk glandular trichomes. Um, the difference is that sessile actually means like resting. Um, sessile similar to, when you think sessile, think like a barnacle on a whale or, or, or stuck to the shore, right? So these are glandular heads that are resting directly on top of the surface. Um, and then the third type and the, the lesser known and less researched type is uh, bulbous glandular trichomes, which is really, really small uh, trichomes. Um, again, just to kind of go over what I just said, um, this is an image that has artificial coloring just to make it a little easier to process the differences. Um, again, if you look at this um, red arrow over here, you're going to have this style again, which would catch pollen if you were breeding or open pollination um, to pollinate this female cannabis plant. You have your green arrow here, which is your non glandular trichome, those physical barriers. Um, yellow being these short bulbous trichomes, and then this blue arrow, um, again, a sessile glandular trichome. Um, the biggest difference between these glandular trichomes, which produce metabolites um, within each other, is they have specialized cells that are made for the synthesis and the storage of these metabolites. So again, to kind of make this relevant, um, these glandular trichomes that we're looking at, this is where we are finding the highest concentrations of cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids. Um, what's really interesting about the differences is the gland size is the first thing that you can obviously see. Um, sessile and stalk glandular trichomes can have similar sized head, while bulbous trichomes are much, much smaller. Um, the actual cell count in the head of the gland, um, and then obviously whether it has a stalk or no stalk, just strictly uh, applying to stalk glandular trichomes. Um, one other interesting thing that's come out in research is that there is a uh, monoterpene to sesquiterpene difference between sessile glandular trichomes and uh, stalk glandular trichomes with stalk glandular trichomes having a more monoterpene dominant profile and sessile glandular trichomes having more sessile glandular or sessile or sesquiterpene dominant profile. Um, again, what's really important before we kind of move into the research is the, the purpose of these trichomes is not to produce for you as a human. Uh, the purpose is for this living organism, which is a sexually mature female plant awaiting reproduction and pollination to produce these molecules um, in response to their environment based on, you know, combination of genetics, nutrients, and environment. Um, but that doesn't always mean that every part of the plant is doing this evenly or even, uh, you know, consistently. So something that was really interesting, uh, I was an adjunct professor at a community college, and it was really interesting to um, kind of teach the natural morphology of cannabis plants. I think you hear so many trimming and training techniques that people forget um, cannabis kind of naturally grows like a Christmas tree and not literally, but um, obviously it's wider at the bottom and then it's more narrow at the top, focusing most of its energy um, at the top or apical meristem where a circle is. Um, Dr. Bernstein said something really awesome last week and I'm glad she kind of said it and I want to preface that is that um, she said a tomato plant, you know, all the tomatoes are kind of going to get chopped up and put in a salad. So at one point, you know, you harvest when you harvest. Uh, but I was curious on cannabis plants, how different could these trichomes be affecting possibly the CBDA concentration within the same plant, but just at different locations? Um, so that's kind of the basis of uh, some of my work. Um, so I'm just going to take you all through um, kind of where I am in my work so far. Um, and then you all can ask any questions at the end. Uh, so the hypothesis of my work is essentially to check the quantity or density, um, and I'll explain the difference between those of trichomes. And um, my guess is that trichomes will vary significantly across different parts of the plant, just because even if it's, you know, one node at the bottom that's maybe in the shade of another one, or that was kind of my guess. Um, and then CBDA concentrations uh, being compared to those quantities. And is there any type of correlation between that? Um, or are we just seeing differences that maybe uh, are attributed to something else that we're not measuring? Um, when I say local variation or sample location, you'll see a one, two, and three. Um, these just refer to the apical meristem or the tallest flowering node. 50% um, of that node's height, so 50% of the, the tallest flowering node. And then the lowest flowering node that I could collect uh, two, tenths, um, two tenths of a sample from, so uh, two tenths of a gram. Uh, so we had seven cultivars. There were eight, but they died. Um, they were all grown in a uh, federally compliant, uh, state-licensed greenhouse facility. 
Um, all samples were harvested at week nine of flowering. Uh, and again, what we did was analyze the tallest flowering node, the uh, half of that height, and then the lowest flowering node. And two samples were collected at each location just to kind of see if there were massive differences. Um, the cultivars were intentionally anonymized. The reason that I did this is because um, for people who maybe don't understand the processing or the extraction, I don't want to uh, either have my research manipulated or misrepresent uh, maybe the trichome density of these, of these different cultivars. Because again, grown in different environments, it could show you know, a totally different expression of metabolites, trichome density, things of that nature. Uh, so our, the research layout was on-site floral custom analysis. So as soon as I showed up um, and actually measured and marked this top, middle, and bottom of this plant, um, I went ahead and ran uh, cannabinoid analysis. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I also collected uh, samples from each location, took them back to the laboratory immediately, and dissected the floral, floral clusters, looking for one individual calyx kind of at the most distal part um, of the uh, branch of that node that I collected. Um, those individual calyces were fixed to a brass stub and imaged under SEM. There were two different fix, uh, fixation methods that we used, so methanol-ethanol fixation as well as liquid nitrogen just to kind of compare, um, and I'll talk about why we did that. Uh, those images were uploaded to ImageJ where I manually have been counting trichomes for the last, I'm not sure how many months, um, but that data was then uh, calculated against the calyx length, width, and area uh, to create a density metric. And then um, data tab was used in Excel uh, to kind of do our statistical analysis. Um, we are still working, but I do kind of want to run you all through where we are in the research. Uh, so my three main aims, the first one, again, uh, to compare methanol-ethanol fixation to liquid nitrogen. The reason behind this is methanol-ethanol is a, it's a more traditional plant fixative method. Um, the issue with this is anybody who kind of knows how they make uh, uh, made old medicine or how they make what's called tinctures, um, as soon as I heard methanol, ethanol, I was like, oh, I think that that's going to cause an, that, that's an extraction, essentially. Um, so I wanted to compare traditional uh, fixative methods. And when I say fixative, I mean the uh, scanning electron microscope that I use operates within a vacuum. And this vacuum <clears throat> samples that contain water um, will kind of just be distorted when this vacuum occurs. So, prior to actually imaging in the SEM, um, the samples either need to be dehydrated or fixed or uh, uh, some, something that'll keep them stable and safe uh, so they can image, be in, imaged inside the machine. Uh, aim two was to use cryo SEM to image individually dissected calyx. And then in, uh, aim three was to analyze floral clusters. So. Uh, again, the same uh, size sample from each of these clusters that you see in the picture, and this is uh, one of the best examples that I have. Um, these are all from the same plant, same cultivar, but they were collected from different locations. And just at first sight, when you look at them um, visually, there's obviously, you know, you can see differences um, in between those three different locations. Uh, and aim three was to analyze those floral cluster samples. So to actually take that again, analyze that metabolite concentration and then compare it to the density to see if there was any type of correlation at all. Um, just so I don't lead you all along, we're not finished, so I don't have the answers for you today, um, but I did want to update you all on kind of how this applies to harvest and, and where we're going. Uh, so aim one was methanol ethanol fixation. Uh, the image over to the left is what it looks like prior to actually being inserted into the scanning electron microscope. Um, this was soaked in methanol for 10 minutes, switched back to uh, ethanol, and then back to methanol one time. Um, and it was treated with a critical point dryer. So you can even see just looking at it, um, it doesn't really have any green color to it anymore. Um, but it, it is, again, the most common and traditional way to uh, image uh, plant samples in a scanning electron microscope. Uh, the other method that we prepared was using liquid nitrogen. So you can see I have our liquid nitrogen tank here. Uh, this is a cold resistant bowl, which we pour the liquid nitrogen directly into. Um, a leaf or plant sample is fixed to a brass stub, and then we actually dip it in that liquid nitrogen. It, equil it equilibrates bubbles as the sample is, uh, is cooling. And then um, once it actually stops bubbling, that was just kind of our consistent, we take it out of the liquid nitrogen once it stops bubbling. Um, 
there's kind of a really quick time limit after that where you have to drop this brass piece into the silver holding piece and insert it into the electron microscope. Um, this leaf, I don't want anybody to think I'm, I'm being fake. This leaf is not a cannabis leaf. Um, this leaf is actually from, uh, I think it's traditionally called a Cuban oregano, which is not the, the appropriate name for it, but that's its more well-known name. Um, and it is a plant that is rich in terpenes. So I was very interested because I used to walk by it every day in the greenhouse and kind of rub my hand on it. And I would smell that this smells lemony. Um, and I got very interested talking to my thesis advisor. I said, hey, you know, if there's terpenes being produced in this other plant, maybe instead of wasting hemp samples uh, while I'm still trying to learn these methods, I can use another plant and really test out and see how well um, this method works to use liquid nitrogen to image. So um, this is actually the image of that. If you see this video over here to the left. So this is the surface of what I just showed you. And this is what it would look like under an electron microscope, essentially. Um, taking that and increasing that resolution and that magnification all the way down to the surface. Uh, whenever I'm doing this work, I always wonder, you know, where Dr. Seuss got a lot of his ideas from. Um, and I say that jokingly, but something that's really interesting is, uh, sorry, I wanted to pause that. Um, something that's really interesting is if you look at the uniformity under here, uh, it almost looks like it, it's built in a very specific way. So that's why I got curious about density. Um, and the actual count and why there are differences. Why are there bulbous trichomes right here? And why is there a stalked trichome right next to it? Um, again, this isn't in a cannabis sample, but I use this as a proxy essentially or a practice um, to get the methodology down. Um, because like I said, um, SEM is kind of an art form. I've met a lot of people who do it, but I realized everybody does it a little differently. Um, and I found out that this methodology worked really well for um, some of the images that I was trying to take. Um, so uh, liquid nitrogen versus uh, methanol, ethanol. So these two images, the image over to the left is going to be the liquid nitrogen sample that was prepared um, from a cannabis plant. And uh, the image to the right is going to be methanol, ethanol uh, prepared image. Um, so the pros and cons are really what we were looking at in this aim to see, hey, should we use the traditional fixative method of methanol, ethanol preparation, or should we use liquid nitrogen and go, you know, more cryo SEM? Um, so what we noticed was very obviously, if you look over to the right, um, comparing the pictures, the some of the glandular trichomes or these heads that um, in the image over to the left, you'll see they not a perfect sphere, but again, um, the morphology is, is very uh, distinctive from the image to the right where the only way I can really describe it is it, it looks kind of like uh, uh, balloons have been deflated, right? So the whole purpose of this is to try to preserve the natural profile, uh, all the image, all the images that we took were from samples that were not dried, they were not cured, they were taken from live uh, cannabis plants. And that's one of the first things that really stood out to me over here to the left. If the trichomes are what are producing these metabolites, and we're typically distorting these trichomes, whether it be drying, curing, things of that nature, um, the image over to the left that we use liquid nitrogen seemed to um, give us really high resolution pictures with not a lot of distortion or kind of warping. Um, I will be transparent and say the biggest difference is when you use liquid nitrogen, your, your sample is destroyed in the process. There is no way to pull it out, analyze it later, or do anything else with it. Um, when you use methanol, ethanol, that, that, that sample is actually able to be stored um, in a controlled environment and then used again later. So for our research, um, we use liquid nitrogen. The reason that I brought up what I just said is um, the industry standard for floral cannabis, um, again, we're talking about harvesting, is to air dry process uh, prior to processing and packaging. Um, I got really curious in the process of using liquid nitrogen and methanol ethanol and was thinking, hey, if the most common way is neither one of these, you know, prior to processing or, or, uh, or anyone consuming it or whatever it's being used for, we're typically drying. We understand that there's decarboxylation going on, but I don't hear much conversation about what's going on with the morphology of the trichome. So um, this is kind of an extreme case. We just left this out in a room um, at room temperature. I didn't put it in a, in a like a climate control um, kind of box or anything or in a room where we control the climate. I was curious just to see at two weeks, just on a counter, kind of what the differences would be. 
Um, and these SEM images show, again, um, not the same as that methanol ethanol or that solvent based fixation, but you can see um, this kind of uh, distortion of the glandular heads. Again, they look like deflated balloons. And even the, if you look at the floor or the, the base uh, where these trichomes are, you can kind of see almost this, uh, it almost looks wrinkled or, or kind of shriveled. Uh, AIM-2 was the image quantification. So once these images were taken from each of these locations, um, the area was actually calculated for each image. Um, if you look at this image on the bottom, we actually use the scale bar in image J to set the ratio so that the scale bar in the bottom right-hand corner of the image, the set, um, where is it? on the bottom right at 500 micrometers, that we were actually able to relate that to a pixel ratio. So that way we were able to analyze um, the not only the glandular count, but the calyx length with and the density, which we used area, um, like the image in the upper left-hand corner to calculate. Excuse me. Um, also for sample analysis for the glandular trichome count, um, I left some of these undone. I know somebody's going to say it doesn't look like they've all been counted. Um, once you count all of these and you circle each one manually, it becomes a very dense uh, picture to look at and you can't really see what's underneath. So you can see there's still some bulbous glandular trichomes that are uh, visible kind of in the middle of that picture. But each of those red dots represents a glandular trichome that I manually went ahead and counted um, using image J software. Uh, and then AIM-3, uh, kind of, you know, uh, comparing a lot of these differences. And there's a ton of different variables that I share. Um, we're really, really close to being finished, but I don't want to share prematurely. But uh, looking at this picture in the upper left-hand corner, again, this is the same thing. Um, if you look from, I believe, let's see, left to right, um, each of these rows represent a different cultivar and samples collected from, again, the apical meristem, 50% of that apical meristem height, and then the lowest flowering node. Um, two tenths of a gram of each kind of floral cluster or inflorescence was homogenized and combined with 30 milliliters of methanol, agitated for five to eight minutes, and then four milliliters of the sample was injected um, into the Light Lab 3 portable chromatography device. And that is how we calculated the uh, CBDA concentration live um, as soon as we remove these uh, floral clusters. One thing I want to give a disclaimer for, I don't want anyone to be upset at me. Um, I don't want anybody to think that I am boosting my CBDA numbers. I actually did this on purpose because this is one of the biggest questions in the industry is when we see tests, when we see the cannabinoid concentrations, the terpene concentration, what is being represented there? Um, so I got really interested in looking at calyx. That was the primary basis. I didn't want leaves and I didn't want stems because I was imaging isolated calyx with all those other parts removed, I decided to isolate and only test um, the cannabinoid concentration of calyx since these are where the highest density of glandular uh, trichomes um, are resting. So this image right here, again, shows two tenths of a gram of the same sample from the same plant on the same branch. Um, and you can kind of make the assumption, right, from what most of us know that these two samples tested uh, differently. And it's because, again, if some of these leaves and some of these stems have a lower trichome density, you would expect that the concentration of metabolites would be lower. Um, so this is just a kind of uh, profile, cannabinoid profile of um, once you run your actual test using the light lab. So these were actually put into my Excel sheet and compared to trichome density based on each location. This is just a quick picture to kind of give you a, a, an idea of what it's like. So this picture all the way to the left is gonna be the calyx isolated from the top of the plant. This is the middle of the plant in the middle and then the bottom of the plant all the way to the right. So again, they were measured for width, length, area, trichome density, and then the floral cluster that they were sampled from was analyzed for um, CBDA concentration. Um, these are all the total metrics of analysis. Um, once I finish this research and um, go ahead and defend my thesis and make it public. Um, but I did want people to know that um, all the cultivars from the same location, uh, the trichome density of each cultivar. So again, trichome density of say plant A 
at location one, two, and three, which would mean the same plant at the top in the middle of the bottom. Um, those were compared as well as the CBDA concentrations and some of the other variables that um, we're looking at is calyx width versus length. Does that have anything to do? Is there a difference between the top of the plant and the bottom of the plant um, and other locations as well as area, glandular trichome count, um, and just kind of comparing all these different variables. Um, just really quickly, again, I don't want to spoil everything. I do still have to present this research uh, to my thesis committee, but the average glandular trichome count was something, um, again, one of the first things that we actually got and we counted. So the bar on the left of each sample will be the apical meristem location one, two follows as the middle, and then three being the lower. These were the count of glandular trichomes. I did not separate glandular stalks from sessile glandular from bulbous, A, because as the density uh, increases, it becomes very difficult to even see the bulbous glandular trichomes. Um, and B, I wanted to make sure that uh, we were actually including all trichomes that contributed to some type of metabolite concentration, regardless of what little way, shape, or form it may be. Um, so these are just our counts. Uh, in my mind, you know, uh, we like to think that the, the plant is produced evenly, that it ripens evenly, that these trichomes are going to be the highest at the top, you know, a moderate out, amount in the middle and the lowest at the bottom. Um, but that's not the case. In fact, it was highly variable. Um, one of the things I have to remember in research is that it's always great if you find something, but more often than not, you, you won't find anything. Um, and you use that research to write to kind of build more research from that. Um, so average CBDA concentrations, again, these are typically higher than what you would normally see. That is because all the stems, all the non-glandular, uh, excuse me, all the uh, floral parts that don't, don't contain a high density of uh, glandular cannabinoids were removed, and these are just the calyx. Um, so from each location, you'll see, if you look at plant sample A, it's kind of what people would typically expect, highest at the top, moderate in the middle, big drop at the bottom. Um, but there are some differences between different cultivars and sample F was pretty in interesting um, because the CBDA concentration didn't vary much at all um, from the top and middle and the bottom. Um, this is just a box plot of uh, the length in millimeters versus the, um, oh, this, sorry, this is the difference in length average across each sample. Um, in millimeters. The reason we were looking at this is because I was curious if each cultivar, um, if there was like a, a normal size of calyx, uh, you'll see research will kind of say there's a certain size of calyx, uh, but what we realized from each sample was that they could be totally different. Uh, G was kind of our outlier, uh, but again, there's still more data to contribute to this. Um, so the preliminary conclusions kind of from this aim and to make it applicable for harvest, why did we do all this talk about um, glandular trichomes? Um, first, the results revealed that trichomes are very sensitive and delicate, and exposing them to methanol ethanol can dissolve them, uh, which makes kind of the imaging after that not representative of a natural living cannabis plant's trichomes. Um, the SEM images that were obtained from the top and middle and the bottom of the plant, um, there's obvious differences that were shown, but we do need more research to go ahead and be able to say there's any type of uh, correlations between different locations. From what we've seen so far, uh, it's been vastly different, different at each spot, um, which again has been part of the research process, but um, the summary of these results and to make it applicable to a farmer uh, or anyone who's cultivating, there are so many factors that go into trichomes, I had to take a step back afterwards and consider what else might be at play if we're looking at the same plant, which is the same genetics, this isn't a clone, this is the exact same plant. So where is this variability coming into play if we're using the same testing device, the same methods, the same solvents? Um, where could this variability kind of come into play? And these are kind of some of the things for farmers to think about. Um, the genetic potential, right? What, what kind of mother plant is it? Where are you getting your genetics from? Um, are you going to be pollinating that plant um, to get seed or are you taking clones from that plant? The seed stage, we have to think about environments and nutrients along with the genetics from that mother plant. So is there some type of epigenetic effect on trichomes where, uh, where possibly the environment is affecting this expression of different metabolites, um, even in very subtle ways on the same plant? Um, and then to consider that, you know, we're really looking at this glandular trichome production in floral cannabis, 
in these uh, sexually mature female cannabis plants um, only once they are unpollinated and they continue to swell and increase their uh, cannabinoid concentrations. Um, the opinionative method that's been used traditionally is that clear, cloud, and amber, clear, cloudy, and amber um, are the subjective means which we use with the naked eye or a low magnification um, imaging device to analyze these trichomes, but those don't give uh, concrete insight into something that can protect the farmer from cultivating a federally non-compliant uh, floral cannabis plant. Um, also to take into consideration that trichomes are not only sensitive um, you know, afterwards, but they're sensitive on the plant as well. So pre-harvest and post-harvest, the environment that it's exposed to, whether it's a dry room, uh, whether it's in an airtight device, whether it's exposed to humidity, all these things can affect the cannabinoid concentration and essentially make it look like you have a different metabolite profile prior to you harvesting and analyzing just with your naked eye. And then you analyzing that sample two or three weeks after it has sit in a certain environment. Um, and again, we saw that trichome deg degradation when uh, with the air dry samples. Um, and then compound analysis, when we're saying CBDA concentration, um, what material is represented in the sample is being tested? Kind of those two images that I showed. Are we looking strictly at the most dense parts? Are we looking at the kind of whole inflorescence? Um, and that kind of, you know, that's a, a long rabbit hole to talk about um, in compliance and testing and things of that nature. Um, and then is the post-harvest environment affecting these trichomes and the secondary metabolite quality? We know about decarboxylation, um, but we don't often talk about the actual uh, quality of the trichomes uh, post-harvest. Um, I'd like to thank my advisor, uh, Dr. Ghana. I'd like to thank my committee, uh, Dr. Maselli and Dr. Earhart. Um, thank you to the core facilities at Chicago State University for keeping that electron microscope working uh, during all these hot summers and power outage and different difficulties. Um, and then thank you to Orange Photonics for uh, allowing me to use the Light Lab 3 uh, portable cannabis analyzer for uh, field sampling. And thank you to Cornell University for having me as a feature speaker for this webinar series. Oh, you're very welcome. That was a great presentation, Steve. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Let me see. So let's, uh, there's three Q&A. Have you tried using an environmental scanning electron microscope? They allow viewing of living materials. UIUC has one in their microscopy facility if you want to try. I have not. I would love to try. Um, I've learned a lot about kind of the differences in electron microscopes, and that was one of the things that we didn't have access to. Um, but yes, that is kind of the path that we're trying to start this conversation. Um, instead of us always looking at the metabolite concentrations of a cannabis plant that's been harvested and is no longer alive, why don't we start looking more into the inside of these, uh, these organisms while they're still living? So uh, great question. Uh, did you see any structural variation in trichome samples collected from different locations and environment between the genotypes? Um, so we didn't do any we didn't do any genotyping. Um, each cultivar that we looked at, if that's what you're asking, um, yes, we did see differences in each cultivar, but it was so vastly different that um, you know, again, I think something that would have been amazing, right? This amazing breakthrough would have been if we found out, yeah, it, there's an even difference between the top, the middle, and the bottom. There's this kind of gradual gradient of trichomes, but no, there was definitely structural differences um, in the morphology and the density at the same, within the same plant at different locations. Um, but yeah, if that's what you mean by genotypes. Um, given the limited time and budget, what would you want to research? Yeah, so I would like to do a genetic component to that, uh, whether it's epigenetics, genetics, genomics, just because we now have insight to kind of this, um, the genes that go into THCA synthase and CBDA synthase. And I think even knowing that and knowing uh, that we can test these genetics, we're still finding out that there's this variability, right? This uh, plasticity, if you want to call it. Um, we know that because clones grown in different environments um, are obviously vastly different. So that's kind of something if I had an unlimited budget and cloudy versus clear at harvest, half clear. I'm guessing you're asking me my opinion. Um, I, I guess that's the whole point of my research in this talk is that it's so subjective, right? Um, 
I've even, when I've been working with cultivators and, and farmers, I've asked them, you know, 70, 30, 60, 40, and they'll say it's different for every cultivar because they are using their nose and they are using their eyes and they're kind of, some of them have a really good technique down um, and some of them, you know, they realize that, hey, sometimes we do have to destroy our crops because they're non-compliant because maybe one plant that looks, you know, 60, 40 is okay, but maybe another plant that's 60, 40 becomes non-compliant. So, um, hello, I have a few questions, Peter. Oh, Peter, that's a couple questions. All right. Um, what are the issues do you believe? How much time do we have, Luis? Uh, it's supposed to end at 3 p.m., but if there are many questions and we need to cover them all, we can extend that for a little bit. Oh, we got 12 minutes, right? Okay. Um, I have a few questions to ask you. What other issues do you believe persist in the cannabis industry with regards to its growing preparation or consistency as both business owner and researcher? Um, what other topics are still fresh for research in regards to cannabis and hemp? What has your experience been as a plant science researcher focusing on cannabis? Any difficulties in approval, finding information, sources, grants, anything unexpected? Um, yes, that's why I started with the DEA Schedule 1 status. Um, that is obviously prohibitive um, to a lot of research that we're trying to do. Um, are there any fresh topics? Everything. <laughs> um, I think that's why we're here. And it's not a novel field, but we're diving back into something humanity kind of took away from themselves during prohibition. What are the issues do you believe persist in the cannabis industry? Um, I think that as uh, each state begins to legalize, I think if you go immediately to indoor cultivation and mass production, um, you take away this kind of uh, environmental parameters that have been used to get us to the um, kind of genetics that we have now, these local microclimates, uh, Appalachians, terroir, if you will, um, that have the effect on how these plants are cultivated. So I think one thing is to consider, you know, these environments and how much they do affect um, cannabis plants. And like I tell people, you know, Florida and California both grow oranges, um, but, you know, they grow them for particularly different reasons. So I think we'll get more into a regionality, more microclimates, um, maybe an heirloom, hopefully, um, kind of overhanging that covers uh, those kind of quote unquote legacy farmers, if you will. Can you discuss the optimal environments in which to store cannabis post-harvest to produce degradation of desirable compounds? Yeah, so again, this is, and I hate giving people the it depends answer, um, but it really does depend even just in the structure of the actual bud itself, um, that could change the actual airflow that you need. Say you have really, really dense floral clusters where they're kind of overlapping on each other as they're drying and curing. Um, that may require more airflow than something that is kind of more, um, I hate using the, right, the traditional, what we consider sativa morphology or more leggy or more spread out. Um, Peter asked another question. What do you recommend based on your experience to those getting interested in cannabis research? Um, find a topic you're passionate in and be patient and learn your local policy because what I can do in Illinois is not the same as what Louise can do in New York, is not the same as what you know, people can do in different states. So I think that's really, really important. Find something you're interested in and then learn your local legislation. Is there any possibility of trichomes changing from one form to the other with time? Yeah, so uh, this is kind of one of the like kind of groundbreaking researches that's out there. It's not mine. Um, I don't want to take credit. It's uh, Sam Livingston uh, in Canada. He actually had a project where he compared sessile glandular trichomes to stalked glandular trichomes and in checking the actual transcriptome because they have different metabolites that they're producing. One is more sesquiterpene, one is more monoterpene. Well, the Transcriptome isn't different. They don't seem like they're any different, but they are producing different um, metabolites. So the thought process is that possibly ses sessile glandular trichomes would be precursors to stalked glandular trichomes, which makes a lot of sense. They're the same size. And literally what we realized is morphologically, nobody technically has a classification between the two. When does sessile become stalked? Like how far above the surface? Does it have to be flat on the surface? Can it be raised a little bit? because there's some sessile glandular trichomes that sometimes are just above the surface. Is that gonna keep developing into something that's right raised above the surface or not? So definitely a possibility and that's kind of where the research is right now. That's why we need to learn more because we honestly don't know. 
have you looked at or know any correlations between trichome production and viruses we've seen in cannabis plants? Um, so that is where I'm hoping that we get. I'm hoping that when we look at some of these plants that are more, um, I'll use powdery mildew for, for kind of an easy example. Is there a cannabis plant that is uh, better at being more resistant to powdery mildew? Okay, is there some type of genetic component in there? Got you. Now from there, does that have anything to do with the trichome differences? Are, is there any type of metabolite differences uh, or is it just something totally unrelated? So great question. This is kind of why, you know, I tell people when we're really talking about cannabis, most of us are only talking about glandular trichomes. We're only talking about the metabolites that are produced. You know, we kind of leave seed and fiber and grain, um, the really, really, you know, big potential industries, we leave them out. But I think if we're going to continue talking about floral cannabis and increasing its supply chain across the country, I think we need more of an agronomic uh, plant science focused rather than, you know, traditionally uh, cannabis research would have been more drug focused. Um, so I think there may be one more. Are you aware of any research that indicates the optimal environment is to dry and cure cannabis, such as temperature, humidity, and gaseous content of the air? I will send Louise some research after this that's going to be available. Um, it's not my research, but there is research that has different opinions on optimal environment. But again, I think that's one of the beautiful things about this. If I say the optimal environment to dry, the optimal environment to dry, what cultivar? At what age was it harvested? What is the floral architecture? Literally, does the airflow make a difference? Is this one more prone to bud rot because its floral architecture is tighter and denser? So I don't want to avoid your question, but I also don't want to be misleading because I think we have a lot of people online as experts kind of saying, this is the absolute best way to do it and you should only do it within these parameters. And I think what people should do is start harvesting small samples of your plants and you should start testing them in a, in a kind of a linear fashion. And we tested it at 40% humidity, 50% humidity, 60% humidity. And we looked at the content you know, afterwards. We looked at the trichomes, we looked at the cannabinoid concentration and then you make your own kind of in-house research and development because that's what we need right now. Oh, I got another one. All right. Can you compare indoor versus outdoor production of trichomes? Is it different? Um, so the research says that based on, so again, the purpose of these trichomes, right? Think about it. They're environmental, excuse me, they're environmental protectors, whether it be the non-glandular that are physical barriers or the glandular. Um, that are these kind of chemical biofactories that are essentially extending from the plant surface. Um, so the research that I've seen, there is a ma major difference between the type of radiation or light spectrum that it's exposed to. Um, so UV radiation or shorter wavelength, higher energy radiation um, seems to increase the production of trichomes, which, you know, theoretically, if you could take, you know, the same cultivar, clone it, put one indoor, one outdoor, if you could measure that, um, you know, if you could, if you could measure that par radiation, if, you know, for lack of better words, um, and compare those two, I'm sure you would see some type of differences, but, you know, again, it's so different in, in each different cultivar. So, uh, got all 11 out the way. Is there anything else in the chat? Yeah, so thank you so much for your presentation, Steve. It was a great presentation. And thank you for answering all these questions. I'm pretty sure that the audience is pleased that we were able to get to all the questions. Uh, well, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Steve, once again. Um, please join us next in the in two weeks, actually, for our last webinar. Um, it will be on May 3rd, and this will be focused on hemp processing, extraction, and testing by Jamila Lamalfa Donaldson from is with university, I believe. Uh, that's how you pronounce it. Um, so, yeah. Thank you so much. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.